I'm going to try to make this uh, a bit more uh, discussion oriented. I'm kind of going to run through uh, a case study of basically what we have been up to for the last six months as it relates to settlement on ILP. Um, and then I really want to bring in like Adrian, Evan, anyone who has either a, like, I would love to integrate a cryptocurrency into ILP or I would love to integrate something into ILP and I don't know how to do it. I would like that side of the discussion. And then I would like people who are thinking about connector architecture, standardization, sort of like how can we have MVPs that are uh, approachable to developers, um, sort of also participate in a discussion, maybe a whiteboard session after I get through these slides. Um, so first, uh, I'm kind of going to give a high level of like my view of the state of settlement on ILP today, um, why we worked on the problem we worked on. Uh, sort of some other things that come to mind when I think about settlement and then have a discussion about how we can do it better or at least clarify the process for people um, since I know this has been one of the sort of like pain points for ILP over the last 18 months. So let's start in. So ILP can interoperate heterogeneous base layers using bilateral credit agreements. So that's all getting down to separating settlement from clearance. A uh, wonderful approach to do things, very flexible. We can go from trusting no one having bilateral credit. It works very nice. In theory and in practice, I will say. Like, this, is a, this is a real thing that we've been working on. We like it. We still like that approach to things. But getting into it, sort of we're, we're clearing packets over here. So Alice is sending an ILP prepare across the wire through a connector. Bob's giving a fulfill. That's how balances are adjusted. No money is moved through this process. Why do we do that? It separates adjustment of balance from the settlement of balance. It's denominated in whatever units we want, which includes denominated in different units between different peers. Uh, so now we can have sort of this uh, nice abstraction where we could interoperate without having everyone use the same thing. Uh, it scales independent of settlement layers, and it's useful for value transfer. All right, so this is a credit network, is my argument for ILP. Uh, and what's interesting about it is that Credit networks are traditionally permissioned. They have a high barrier to entry and low innovation. ILP is asking the question, what would an open permissionless credit system look like? Just a little bit of uh, balance bookkeeping logic here, um, just so everyone can kind of see the problem um, that we work on and why um, it's A, a little bit complex, but B, it also is really use case dependent. So two peers in ILP track a balance with one another. Uh, I really only need to worry about settlement uh, in two directions. The first is if someone owes me too much money and I don't want to extend them any more credit, uh, I expect them to settle and I'm going to stop, doing, uh, stop clearing packets with them. The other, concerning more my money, is uh, if my balance to them is hitting some threshold. And so that's this. I get to my settlement threshold and I call this thing, called the temp settle or however you want to think about it, try, try to send money to my peer. And I go back up to my settlement, my settle two or that could be zero. Um, and so if I, if I get to some automated threshold, I'm going to try to give you money until I'm back to some other level. And you can think about this delta right here, right, between settle threshold and min as sort of like an application specific thing uh, that really controls the user experience. It's a bad time if I go settle threshold, asynchronous call, hit min, my user can no longer spend money for the video they're watching or for the stream that they're doing. Uh, and then sometime later, they actually complete the settlement. This gets into the idea of like, the latency of how long it took to do this operation really matters for like, everything that ILP does. All right, so this is like the considerations. How often should I settle? That depends on how much credit we have with one another, as well as how much money it costs to settle. How fast can I settle? settle? That depends on the ledger that we're using, as well as how we interact with the ledger. So me sending a base payment over Ethereum is a lot slower than me sending a payment channel claim over Ethereum. But maybe the complexity is different, or the use case is, uh, has different requirements. Why are we settling? Uh, there's many potential use cases for ILP. We've talked about a lot of them today. Uh, they often have very different settlement requirements when you think about it. Uh, infrequent payments uh, might make sense to spend down a large balance with someone. Uh, something like streaming video, you might want to do very, very fast uh, payments but infrequent settlement, whereas something like trading cryptocurrencies, you might want to settle all the time because you're not extending each other very much credit. And then the final question, what kind of user experience do I need to deliver? So the ways in which you parameterize your system are often more dependent on that last question, and sort of that drives the requirements of how you're going to settle. All right, so settlement today. It's a lot of plugins. It's the short answer. Uh, if you search interledger.js, you're going to get 14 plugins back. Um, and there's, I know about some more plugins. There's, there's custom forks out there. 
Um, there's no canonical implementation. So when someone asks, like, hey, what's a good plugin to look at, I can't give them an answer that I'm 100% you know, sure is the right answer. And then today, most Ledger plugins use payment channels. So I can't really even point you at a layer one base settlement plugin, although there's a few out there now um, that exist. I typically have to point you at something that uses payment channels, which you may or may not even know what that is. Uh, and then new connector implementations will probably lead to more forks. So the way in which you think about how much work or how little work the connector is doing, how often, how, the, how much the connector knows about peer balances, and the ways in which it interacts with the database that keeps balances, change the plugin architecture materially enough that I don't think you can just automatically assume that like a little change to the connector won't affect the plugin. Sometimes it makes sense to re-architect the plugin in response to changes in the connector. So all of this has created this uh, problem of when someone's like, I want to add my blockchain to ILP, it's a tough process. Uh, it's hard to point them where to go. And it, uh, it is difficult to say how much work it will be, because it's often specific to a lot of questions, including what do your users want to do with this once you've done that. Um, so the takeaway has been that integrating new ledgers has been slow. All right, so I'm going to go into a case study. Uh, around what we've been working on. Um, so we demoed Switch yesterday. It's a way to trade uh, cryptocurrencies peer-to-peer -peer using uh, ILP in the background. Um, and so our requirements for that were essentially as non-custodial as possible and the trades are fast. Um, so like a, a better shapeshift experience that can also be peer-to-peer. -to, -peer. to satisfy those choices, we had to have all trades occur in payment channels. Layer one was too slow, especially for blockchains like uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin. You just really can't do non-custodial trading unless or close to non-custodial trading unless the payment sizes are very small. And you can't do small payments with Bitcoin and Ethereum for a number of reasons. So moving everything up into payment channels. And then the second design we made is that user connections should be persistent, even if they close the application, so that like our balances are living at layer two. We're trying to have users think about their balance living at layer two, and then it's immediately spendable, immediately transferable. Essentially, we, we chose to re-implement all the plugins in order to do this. Um, and the reason we did that is because the early plugin implementations uh, sort of, to us, uh, needed standardization as much as possible, um, but also needed to accom accommodate this notion that like, we're going to be settling really, really fast between peers, which wasn't always in the original architect's minds. And it actually took us a long time to arrive at something stable and secure. And that was one of the big like, kind of surprises. Like You have a payment channel implementation. Somebody already did that. We didn't have to write our own. How hard is it to like, open a payment channel, deposit into it? send a payment channel message between peers. But it turns out there's all sorts of like bad conditions where peers get deadlocked. So if like I adjust my balance incorrectly at any time in this process, I could start rejecting your packets incorrectly. Um, or if a peer sends me like a nonsense message, uh, I have to make sure that I've like basically coded to a degree where I don't trust my peer. But the only way that me and my peer can exchange value is direct communication. So I'm not just watching a blockchain anymore, which is a nice passive thing. I, I know how to watch it safely. I now have to watch my peer. And that creates like a, a degree of complexity and implementation that that is really often what makes it hard to be like, this is what it takes to integrate a new ledger. Um, because you have to start getting into like adversarial thinking around exchanging BTP or bilateral messages with your peers. Um, and if you do it wrong, Deadlocks are more common, but you can also have money lost uh, if you do it particularly wrong. Um, and then there's still open questions. So handling fees is annoying. Um, if I pay a fee and I want my peer to pay it, the only way I could do that is to send them a message and be like, I'm charging you a fee. But what's to stop me from just randomly spamming you with messages and hoping that you sort of like adjust the balance in response to them? Uh, it's hard to know what a legitimate sort of like request for out of protocol fees are. And so we just scoped that out. We don't worry about it. We just assume that you pay your own fees, and fees are sort of like out of the, out of the plugin's uh, logic. So that was like the, the process. And even between XRP, ETH, and Lightning, there's not like a unified state diagram, right? XRP has unidirectional state channels that have deposit and withdraw functionality. So I can have a balance, and I can take some out. Uh, in ETH, there's deposit, but not withdraw. That's just how the implementation was. And in Lightning, it's bi-directional, no deposits, and withdraws are not supposed to happen, basically. Like, they're meant to be long-lived channels. Um, and then in exchange for that, you get the notion of routing. Um, so in Lightning, I should be able to reach any peer on the network from one channel, although that's not actually the reality. Um, and sort of like all of those design spaces are slightly moving targets as well, right? Uh, the way that 
those things work today is not how they might work tomorrow. And so you have to kind of keep your eye on them as you're doing it, which is another sort of layer of complexity. And then finally, after we have these plugins working, we wrote an abstraction layer on top that would do the things that users actually want to think about, as opposed to what us backend API people want to think about, which is like open a channel, deposit to a channel, send money, swap between two different channels or uplinks as we call them. Um, and what we notice is like that really does simplify the developer experience. Once you have a plugin, the abstraction layer is really nice. And then for the plugin developer, it gives you a target to say like, well, I need to at least have these methods available on the plugin, um, which is maybe a little bit more concrete than sort of like the ledger plugin interface V2, which is pretty complex and abstract. Um, and so once we got to that point, um, we sort of like built that API and realized that like it's still tough to create a new plugin <laughs> um, and that there's actually sort of many new plugins in the pipeline uh, that other projects want. And so now we're trying to figure out like what's the best way to make this process sort of occur so that not one team is doing the work, but there is like some sort of a standard that we're all achieving. Um, and so at this point, I kind of want to have a discussion with people who are interested in it um, about sort of have you tried doing this? What do you think the future of plugin develop should be? Do you want to change the name? <laughs> sort of things like that. <laughs> Both frivolous and uh, sort of important questions uh, are open for discussion here. Quick show of hands. How many people would be interested in like a whiteboard session to figure this stuff out? No offense taken, if not, not. OK, seems like a lot, of, if not most. Um, maybe what would be good would be to do a whiteboard session, and just everybody who wants to have conversations, separate conversations, please feel, feel free to. So it doesn't have to be like everybody passively listening if you're not interested in this topic. Yeah, and most importantly, like no experts here. I, I do not know if we have hit upon a great architecture. And so I'm happy to hear sort of other people's outside perspectives on this. They could be better than ours. Can you maybe? Um give a bit of an overview of the switch architecture or how that differs, if at all, from like ILP connector and plugins? Switch is just using Switch API, which is just managing a particular connection over a plugin to a particular connector. So we call them uplinks. And, yeah. and you create an uplink, which is a connection between you and a connector over a currency, which is a plugin. Is, is okay, so it's something that has the methods that you described, like withdraw, deposit, send money? So uplinks get passed into functions that have those. The API exposes add, deposit, withdraw, and you pass uplinks into them um, because functional programming. But you can think of it as uplinks have methods, but they don't really. They have, they have just like, get me the balance, sort of things like that. They have getters, but they don't have functions on them. We, we want an API into accounts, and it, I'm, I'm wondering if the switch API is a good starting point to find. Into accounts, yes. Yeah. So the balance is exposed by an uplink. So I can I know my outgoing uh, amount owed. Uh, if we want to get into the code, I can get into the code. I don't have my laptop right here, so this is not my laptop. I was going to pull it up. Um, but yeah, I can show you the interface so that you, we can talk about the exact thing. I don't know. I was thinking it might be helpful to break it, try to break it down a little bit first by like, what currencies do we want to see supported on Interledger before the end of the year is one question. And like, get really specific about what exactly, because as you mentioned, by the way, I thought this was a really good breakdown of sort of this current state of things and re very much resonates. It's like a big, big issue we have to solve. Um, so we should get really specific about like, what specific currencies are we going, or systems are we going to try to integrate? And then try to break down the different use case, categorize the use cases. I'm not sure what the best way of doing that is, but try to figure out like how to parameterize these to figure out what the right experience is. It, it might be useful to show um, how settlement would differ in like a P2P case versus if you're um, swapping an asset. Particularly, like for instance, with the implementation of uh, street peer-to-peer -peer payments. You mean? Yeah, or, or yeah, some case where yeah. Yeah, I think the the pre-funding model makes a lot more sense for a, a payment system. So, like, let's say I'm going to spend a hundred dollars over the course of a year. Um, I might pre-fund say ten dollars a month and just spend off that balance. 
and it would be unexpected to go past that, right? And so I can parameterize that to just like, I need to deposit $10 once a month. And if I get below a dollar, I can like add a deposit. But that deposit can be very slow, because I don't expect sort of balances to be changing very quickly. Whereas the assumption when trading is like, I might want to move all of my ETH into XRP at any given time. I have no idea. So, and I expect it to be quick. So I want to sort of have that experience. Yep. Um, so I'm pretty new to the community, but I was wondering if um, people had been thinking about like a reputation layer at all. So like it seems like there's like um, there's the bilateral bilateral credit agreements where you're completely vulnerable to you know the people that you have the agreements with, and then there's like the settlement layer where it's like okay, we've we've settled it like now I'm not vulnerable at all. But there's this middle ground where it's like you know I've been talking to other folks about this same entity, and it turns out that they pay back or you know they settle things correctly 99% of the time, so it's probably fine. Like is there any kind of mechanism for trying to measure those things and trying to like share that information? So there has been some movement towards like aggregating connector statistics. Um, and that kind of gets into the peering problem of like, it'd be nice if we chose peers a little bit more sensibly. Um, right now, a lot of the peering is sort of like random. Um, and so like you really want to protect yourself if it's in the random case. But yeah, let's hear what Stefan has to say. Yeah, so this, the same problem came up in the context of Codius Hosts, where like we would talk to hosting companies, we'd say like, hey, run Codius Hosts, and they'd be like, well, credit cards don't just solve the payment problem for us, they also solve the reputation problem because we can ban people by their credit card number and avoid them just signing up again. There are caveats to that, but um, I think it's definitely come up as a problem. The only reason I think we haven't, or at least I personally haven't uh, invested much time into it is because I think it's a a very large problem. It's like a, it's, it's a project the size of Intelligent. <laughs> yeah, so the reputation on system on top is a, is a project, sort of the could we collect some metrics, though, uh, that aggregate things that maybe give it like a sort of focal point for performance or reliability seems like a reasonable first go at it. Yeah, I could, I could definitely see how some of that stuff could be gamed, too. So oh, no, I, yeah. I, I Any system will be gamed, yeah. yeah. Issue. Like, you could create simple notes, basically, that are just like, yeah, I always pay. Yeah, myself. yeah, I, I get some sweet volume going <laughs> yeah, through yeah, the system yeah, between yeah. me and my bot farm, yeah. yeah. So I guess, maybe concretely, there's, like, efforts going on right now to work on various connector implementations and efforts on the settlement side, and perhaps just some good coordination between where you know is the settlement side thinking and where is the connector side thinking and what are ways in which this could be architected so that we, for instance, are exposing common uh, interfaces. Yeah. So, yeah, it would well, be very nice to not have to re-implement all of the different ledger integrations in every language yeah. we want to support. So it might be good if you wanted to just do like a quick whiteboard of how one might envision doing a settlement engine that exposes a common interface for various connector implementations to consume? Like, do you think that's worth it to at least? If my name was Kincaid, absolutely, because okay. he wrote all that code and has much more opinion on it than me. For me, it'd be like, here's what Kincaid wrote, and I don't know exactly why he feels that way. Also try to see the solution before you try it. And that's the other problems. thing. It's like, yeah. until I see someone use these things, I won't have a strong opinion either way. For what it's worth, it, it feels like there's at least two of the categories that we need are one is the like very high trust, um, like two connector operators who have a shitload of business between one another. The problem is not really trust so much as just like you want to have some kind of automatic settlement so it's not a pain. And um, and make sure you don't get into a deadlock. Yeah. Great. So that that feels like one kind of solid use case and like. It feels a little bit more like some on, sometimes on ledger settlement would be more appropriate for that, but just having some way of automatically triggering that. And it also seems like you could write an interface to that that is fairly universal, right? That like right. blockchains right. typically expose the send money from account to account function right. in a way that they don't all expose payment channel the same way. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And then so another, I may be thinking not thinking about this granularly really enough, but it feels like another thing that we need is the. I download the software and I connect to the network and I don't know anybody and I haven't configured anything and we need some kind of sensible default so that you have an okay experience, you neither lose money but also your bandwidth isn't like horribly small. Um, that's another like use case that it seems like that may be, we may need to split that out more because you were mentioning like trading may be different than payments 
I'm not totally sure about, about So that. the thing about payments oftentimes is like I kind of have a measured use of what my users are going to do. There's like a variety of options. And sure, some users may be high bandwidth, but like temporally, they all like fall into the same things. Whereas like trading, it can be zero and then thousands of times the activity in like a short burst. But wouldn't um, pay payments also be a short burst because it's... Mm -hmm. I feel like, I don't, I don't know. I, like I haven't done enough in the payment space, but my feeling is like it's actually a little bit more sort of like predictable and low frequency. It's like the the sort of have a balance, spend down it in some linear fashion when you get to some point, top up the balance. Versus trading, it's like, oh, the balance was static and then it went to zero and they had a bad time. Yeah, that's enough. So this is about link, the link between how messages are, IOP messages are communicated and how settlement messages are communicated. Just for context, I think that also depends a little bit on like how much bilateral communication is needed for the settlement mechanism because if you're using on ledger settlement, the answer may be none at all. It may just be I send money on the underlying ledger, you see it come in and you credit my account. Cool, we don't need to talk at all. If we do need to talk, then the reason why we had bundled them originally was that the feeling was if we already went through the trouble of establishing this one communication channel, we might as well use that for these other messages. The downside is then it's harder to separate it from if we have these different ways of communicating. Potentially harder. I think, I think what's interesting is effectively what the name of channels had is a separation between the balance and the actual liquidity availability. Because you've got money that I've sent you and that's a balance that you know you hold. But then there's also a payment channel which is like settlement balance and that has to have a And that's, that's facilitating a specific use case or settlement model which is faster, but not always required. So I, I don't know if it's worth extracting to the point where you say, like, does the settlement system have a certain amount of liquidity available? Um, think of that as money in the channel. Well, I think there's so many different semantics of how these things work on different networks that I think you could say, like, okay, we have send money, but that's gonna mean something totally different between Lightning and XRP and PayChat and sending payments over XRP. That it's almost like, I think if you wanna have that thing that's really, I mean, I, of course we have these two cases where one is you have a lot of, you have a lot of trust in something Kevin was saying. You have a lot of trust maybe between two businesses. Then there's the other one of like, I want, maximum uh, UX. I want this to be the easiest thing to install and use. And I think in the latter case where you just want the easiest thing, really the best wallet is going to be one that was, ex that was specifically designed for whatever currency you're using. You know? I think if I want, if I had a wallet that started as a, I don't know, a Lightning wallet or an XRP wallet and then has interledger functions on top of that, that's going to be something where I'm familiar with how to use it and now here's another feature I can use, rather than a wallet that's kind of got this abstraction over what where my actual money is, and so that that kind of makes it harder to harder to know what's going on. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the API between the connection, let's say a settlement engine, the API is simple: I need you to send money, or you need to tell me when you receive money, and that sure. way I just like, the balance that I keep. But like a connector versus a like a user facing kind of wallet, that's pretty different from a design perspective. Right, and then and then the, the challenge is depending on the use case, you have different settlement models, and your settlement model might be really rapid settlement. In which case, if you call send money and underneath the hood, abstracted away from you, the payment channels, but the payment channel run on liquidity, there's a whole slow process to go top it up you have that time. So you, you call send money expecting a fast turnaround, but that you don't get that. And so some way of measuring, you know, that the ability to when I'm call send money, how likely am I that that's actually going to succeed. That's effectively what's the liquidity under the hood. I don't know if it's worth abstracting that in some way that you know you can see that. I mean personally I think if you write one of the things we should do is come up with an API between connectors that's like HTTP or something, so that 
somebody can write a really good settlement engine for a specific ledger, and then any connector can use that. I, I, I haven't thought of I think so. One, one issue I, I see with that is depending on um, basically the scalability or the performance of the settlement engine, because I think the, the way I've been thinking about it is that if there's like really high performance interledger components, the settlement engine may not be the most high performance thing, and that may be okay, but that also means that the, the, the interledger components have to be able to deal with peer-to-peer -peer messages rather than the settlement engine, because um, you don't want peers being able to take, if a peer can take down your settlement engine, you're screwed. Um, because if that's the thing that's actually watching, like if, for example, if you're using payment channels, you need something that's always watching the ledger for someone trying to close payment channels. If someone can take down that component, you will lose money. And so it's really important that that component doesn't process messages sent by peers because then a peer could DOS that thing tr completely trivially. But it um, can also protect itself from DOSing independently of. I mean, the settlement engine, if, if it's going to have to process, uh, think about every packet that's being fulfilled, it, it has to. But I don't think it should. That, that, to me, that's an important distinction that I, I don't think the settlement engine can be expected to do that. And, and basically, my, my reasoning for that was uh, I'm thinking about like how to make a high performance thing in, in Rust. And I was went down the path of like, OK, should I implement the settlement engine in Rust? And then tried to figure out how to talk to the XRP ledger. And it was, it was a nightmare. I wasted a bunch of hours and was like, this sucks. There's so, like, the documentation for the actual like on the wire protocol thing is really hard to do. Writing parsers is the least fun thing imaginable. <laughs> and I'm like this, I hate this. Um, and so then my conclusion was like, okay, maybe I'll try to link to the C++ implementation. Couldn't get it to compile, fuck this, I'm sorry for the language. I, I was just like, I hate this as well. Wasted four hours on switching back and forth between, actually four hours each on these two approaches, and then it was like, okay. Use one true language. Um, and then it was just, yeah, <laughs> use the, the Stefan's, Stefan's favorite. Uh, so then it was like, okay, the settlement engine has to be written in whatever there is a good SDK for that blockchain, and then it needs to be able to have some other way of talking to these other components. But then I, I do feel strongly that like, I want to make sure that my JavaScript settlement engine is not blasted with ILP packets by a, a peer that's sending tons and tons of messages. Because like, there's, I don't think there's a good way of protecting it just because packet floods are so, like, I don't know, it's fundamentally hard to deal with. But I think there's a line there where you're saying the, the sort of pro, the boundary between the process of the the ILP processing and the process that does settlement stuff is also where the abstraction has a boundary. To say like those are in different processes, but you could also say here's a module that I put into the connector itself, which is written in Rust, mm -hmm. and all that does is send packets to the settlement engine. But that's behind some kind of that effectively is part of the settlement engine, the thing that sends balance updates or whatever. So you kind of have like Adrian's version of it's it's oh, the settlement Adrian. engine from an abstraction point of view. Hmm. Um, Somehow you need to notify the settlement engine all payments you get. You either have to do it per payment or you have to do it in aggregate. Yeah. But you're in the aggregate you have settlement risk and you've got to account for that. So you've got the risk that, that the payments you process are going to be on some sort of threshold that you can't set Yeah, and so my question around this, at least the way we think about it, is set a t uh, Balance updates should be atomic with clearance, and so it should be impossible to go past your maximum um, cleared packets. Uh, like, it should not be possible to have the balance be an asynchronous process with the clearance of the final packet. Um, that the, the, pa the me saying yes or no to a packet should ping the balance in a way that I know that that balance was unlocked and correct at the time that I called it, um, essentially a mutex on the balance before I clear it. But that once you have that, you can then have an internal settlement process that's just, again, implementing the notion of settle threshold. And I have to configure that so that I can continue before I get to my minimum and generally
get my balance back up. That's what data, like we should leverage databases for that because I think it, like that's what databases are built for is like doing atomic transactions, which is really what you want. You want to be able to like update this row if and only if this the, the value afterwards doesn't exceed this other value. That's yeah, really and there's no other process ac accessing that value right or now. Or there, there may be many transactions coming in, but you need to do this in a serializable way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what we've seen in the, the modular project is that <coughs> that is always been a big bottleneck, trying to do atomic balance changes on the database. They've got quite a clever way of doing it to events and, and so on. So that Asynchronous but still atomic in terms of how we're transacting the whole way. We can explore that. But the, the point I wanted to make is I think you want to land at a place where your high performance connector is tracking balance in memory, but only up to a very, very limited threshold. So you, you've almost, it sounds like it, it's additional complexity and it's maybe premature optimization, but you, you're tracking a balance that it's atomic because you're tracking it in memory. And every at a checkpoint, you know, whatever, once a second, once every few seconds, that's what gets into the settlement engine to say your balance has changed by this much, this much. That's something that I, I do think that is a, a premature optimization because I think the point that we are at is we need multiple processes and multiple servers acting as if they were one. Um, I don't think we're yet at the point where we're handling so much traffic that you actually want to divide the like the connector into multiple logical connectors that are managing separate balances. I think we will get there, but I don't think we're there yet. And, I, and that's like a level of complexity that I'm not anxious to, to put. I think we're at the point where like, you need to have, if we got to the point where we were processing as many transactions per se, if we were maxing out whatever databases we were using, then I think we would need to move there. But I don't think we're at that point yet. Like databases, I think we have another order of magnitude or, go, or two to go. I agree. Okay. Where I was going with that is if, if we <coughs> consider that as a potential future state, it just changes what the API is to the settlement engine. So instead of saying, I process this packet, I process this packet, you say, increment the balance. It's like balance instructions back and forth. So the connector is saying, based on what I've cleared, either a packet or many packets in aggregate, update the balance to this. Back a response to say about that, and then the settlement engine, based on those events, at some point says, I need to do a settlement or request a settlement on the other side, whatever it would be, and then there's a message in the other direction that says, you know, balance is going to change the other way. I mean, I don't know, from, from our experience <coughs> of like working on things at, at coil and processing a lot of packets, kind of on the, the side of like processing it and then storing every single balance update into the database, or in this case, like a Redis instance. It's actually not, it's still not been a bottleneck yet at 3,000 packets per second. And that's without sharding Redis at all either, which is something that we can do in the future. It's basically if one, I mean, I'm not even sure, I'm not sure what percent of our, I'm not sure what percent CPU Redis is at, but we would have to be processing well over 3,000 packets for a single count, for a single key, for that to become a bottleneck. And so, how would it happen? I'm just curious, if you had multiple accounts, would that, like what would the effect of that be? If you have many different accounts? Basically, um, the way that, that it works with Redis is that the, our accounts are not, they don't have any shared state between them. So I could potentially have one Redis instance per account, and then if, one account is doing 10,000 packets per second and it's maxed out, you still have another instance for another account that you can put 10,000 more packets to. Okay, so then it's just right. CPU. That, that's what I mean by it feels like we're multiple orders of magnitude off from maxing out like the capability, from maxing out the capabilities of like using of it actually needing to split each account. Because I think that's where you get into yeah. like, I'm going to take some of the accounts balance or bandwidth yeah. over for this instance and like split it and up. And just top. to clarify, sorry, real quick. You were saying, and that's doing a Redis update for every packet right now. Yeah, we do, we do an update in Redis for every packet. We actually and is there any constraints on it in terms of 
like, are you running a, a Lewis script or something? It is running a Lewis script. Okay. Yeah. And essentially, we have a, we have a whole set of connectors, which all speak to the same Redis instance. So if you're like a coil user, you know, you have a you have a specific bandwidth, and if you hit one connector and then hit another connector, um, if they all kept that state just in memory, you basically have double the bandwidth. Mm -hmm. But they're all talking to the same Redis instance, which, which turns out to be to be okay from a purple. And they're guaranteed to be getting the like latest yeah, state. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it's atomic binding. Yeah, that's, that's what I assume that you just yeah. get it. Yeah. 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 The proposal, maybe the answer is um, instead of the settlement engine and the connected host speaking to the database, that if we say settlements are you know, only occurring very seldom, that the, what if the uh, connection into Redis is Redis as an example is at the connector. And occasionally, the settlement engine will notify the connector that settlements come in, update your own balance. So rather than both impacting the balance, the interface we need is just the settlement engine speaks to the connector now and then it says, and I received and vice versa, or received a notification. It's kind of what the same money is today, except we define a way for that to be effectively passed out into a standalone process. That feels like the kind of thing that would totally work for on-ledger settlement and not necessarily work for payment channels. What if we did what? something like, sorry, but what if we did something like, um, we have a connector here, and it's but not a <laughs> Let's see, if we have, so right now we're talking about like, here's the, the connector, here's the, the database, Here's the settlement engine. And so the sort of interface between connector and settlement engine would be like an inner process thing here, potentially with some database stuff involved too. And I think that could get kind of complicated. So what if you said like, that this whole part is kind of the settlement engine. And the settlement engine happens to be Composed of multiple processes depending on how you architect it, but the interface between the connector and the settlement engine would be internal to the connector, and it would just be like, "Here's a packet that happened. Um, please do whatever you need to do to make sure we stay settled up." And it would be written in Jurassic script. <laughs> I mean, you could have a different. Why? Uh, so no, that, that sounds like right the part on the left would be written. Would be, written, would be rewritten in every. In yeah, every yeah, that would be the interface. Of, yeah. So then yeah. the standards are the other stuff. Like yeah, that. That you'd have to do that anyway, regardless, because you'd have to write something right into the database. So you're saying like the standard is the database, and the other part of you write it. Now. So, what, so if, if you, um, it, assuming you have the, what, what you can propose to do, so oh, I, would still, I would still have the settlement engine looking at connected to the database, but purely for reads. So the settlement engine is tracking well, the balance to trigger a to deal with it. It, well, it's only reading and writing to the balance, but the only thing that it updates the balance is the connector. And then whenever this receives a settlement, does a settlement, there's a notification to the connector to say, update your balance on that point. Yes, yeah, so you limit the database to write, or the connector it's, it's to writing the, to the, the database. The is your notion there, though, that the settlement engine is just pulling the database? It's like, how is it the learning the when it's, yeah, so it's. And deciding when to make settlements, or it's receiving Settlements from the peer, yeah, and yeah. Then notify yeah, I mean, in the case that it needs to, it needs to watch the database in some way to know when it's been triggered to settle. Correct. Okay. But it again, that, that makes sense if you're if you're operating on like higher trust. I think pulling the database seems fine. If you're reacting on, if like it's really problem. fast, yeah, I don't know if pulling is a great model. But if it's, you pull <coughs> What, uh, what Sorry, what's that? No, no, I mean, like, I mean, Redis is basically just an in-memory store, so, like, you could, it's, it's basically analogous, like, if the database lives in process for, like, lot, like lower trust lines, it's effectively the same thing as all the databases. So you're saying even if you were polling it really fast? No, no, not even polling, you're saying for, for low, like, for lower trust lines, it's like, if, you, if you're just doing something in memory, like, that's effectively the same thing. You just, did, you, did you describe the use case you're saying with this one before? <laughs> I think like the switch use case. Yeah, my question is like, how is the settlement engine efficiently learning about what time it is when it is time to settle? 
So if I like set, so the, the way we think about this, right, is like if I've set this here, I need to know that when settle threshold calls, the settlement will complete before this line is getting hit for any significant period of time. So the ideal is like settle threshold is called, packets are clearing, I got to here, and then I went back up, wonderful. Um, looking at this, it's unclear to me like how the settlement engine, if the settlement engine is close enough to the balance update that it quote unquote knows and this is getting called at the right time, or if it's what's actually happening is like a bunch of packets, then it kind of like learns about it and now it's too late when settle threshold has been called. Yeah, so, so I mean, at least my anticipation was that is complexity that's specific to the settlement engine. The connector doesn't care about any of that stuff. The connector cares about a balance and, and, and should I pull this packet or should I pass this packet on or not? And the, the, the complexity of when should I do settlements, how often, what's the liquidity available, in other words, do I need to top up a payment channel, that should all just sit in the settlement. And the so the only thing that the connector would know about then is the max and min balance. So it would have no notion of settlement threshold and like sort of that thing. Yeah. It seems possible. It does seem like then you're pushing off some complexity to the settlement. Well, the idea being you only have to implement that complexity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you know, my question is why don't why doesn't the connector have a database and then when it wants to affect the settlement, it's called settlement engine, and if the settlement engine receives it, an incoming settlement is called the connector. I think the updating balance logic is so closely tied to what type of settlement you're using. Uh, Why? Like, because like a payment channel, when you want to say, can I process this payment, on this payment channel you're going to be looking at what's the balance of the payment channel. So what you're describing is like when you have multiple layers of balances, and uh, I think the was talking about earlier, um, what I would you say there, turn 90 degrees just to <laughs> <laughs> So what I think what you're talking about is when you have multiple layers of balances. Like I have a balance in my payment channel, then I have another balance which is in my on ledger account. And the way I would look at that is the connector should think about the the highest level balance, which is like what I have available for IoT packets right now. And that's what it owns <coughs> it's, it's data store. And so it would tell the settlement engine, like, I'm running out of that, which is, I guess what's on the screen as well, right? Um, and then the settlement engine itself could have its own database to manage the liquidity vis-a-vis uh, -vis its one ledger account and how much is in the payment channel and so on. So like that can be all handled over here. But what what does like I'm running out of blank mean? Well, it depends. Configured. You could presumably configure that. <coughs> yeah, that's like that's what's on the screen. It's like if basically i I've reached the setup threshold. That's the message that would go with this one. But, but then, yeah, settle threshold as a like where this is is very dependent on the five percent. But it does, but it does seem like the only thing, though, that changes is the number, not the process. Yeah, I think that's pretty great. I may be calling settle threshold, or I may be hitting settle threshold more often when I'm using payment channels, but it does seem true that this general pattern still holds. The only difference is, like, if settle threshold and settle takes an hour, then I have a different assumption, but I should still be able to handle it, I think, in that abstraction. More than that, like it's even, it could be more different between accounts than it is between technologies. Like, like also there, true. There might be a friend that I totally trust saying, and then there might be a, somebody I don't trust at all, and I might set those numbers much differently. So, so I, I still, I agree those are configuration, but I still think the business logic for determining the right values for those and how to behave. Yeah, you would like that in the settlement engine, not in the, the connector. should be making decisions about, oh, I think I'm getting close to so the time I need to settle. The, the, the connector just says, can I afford this pack or not? If I don't true, then I would add an interface here to have it being calculated to appear in the final values of the Because at the end of the day, it's going to be a set of numbers. But then why not just let the settlement engine watch you out? Because you want a simple interface. You're like, well, I'm trying to optimize for this interface will be simple, so this can be okay. you know, JS, this can be Rust, um, and we can have one implementation of this complex stuff over here and one implementation of this complex stuff over here. I mean, the subtle threshold is application level logic, right? I, mean, I should probably not be living in subtle engine. So at least not configured there. <laughs> it's very business logic. It's, it's business logic that's very dependent on the settlement model, the use case, the underlying ledger. Like, if you sell it on ledger versus layer two, the settlement threshold changes and your calculations are on like how soon you need to react based on when you get close to it, all of that stuff. Like that shouldn't be the connected. Right? Like the, the max balance as well depends on what how big has your <coughs> your payment channel. So that's something that 
be either be dy dynamically configurable, and then the settlement engine needs to watch the payment channel and then dynamically configure the connector based on that. So there's so a, yeah, yeah. a safe max balance back from the settlement yeah. engine. There's a set of numbers that the connector needs in order to know how often to call the settlement engine, and that could be calculated over here and then provide a data. It seems like that based on the variables that you're talking about with how much uh, uh, risk I'm willing to associate with here, that in the wallet interface, whatever's exposed to the end user, we should be able to generate some kind of a figure for them that lets them know with the current relationship that you've built between uh, you and your enterprise service provider. Uh, you can transfer this much value per second or per minute. I think like there's like a value per second uh, measurement that was recently pinned by uh, one of the organizations. And uh, it seems like that's something that we could communicate with the user. Um, the other side of it, when we were talking about the reputation system earlier, I think that a lot of, it seems to me that uh, finding a trustworthy connector is going to be something that is going to be handled by uh, the wallet provider in a lot of circumstances when they create proprietary relationships with interledger service providers. Um, so we might be able to agree on this business logic outside of the core protocol in a way that can just be communicated to whatever the settlement engine gets, uh, however it gets configured. Um, I hope that was yeah, I, th I think there's def definitely room for it relationships to be set more explicitly. I think one of the, it feels to me like one of the things that's lacking is the more automatic version. Okay. Like, like Coil and Strata have set up, you know, their specific relationship. And so we don't really need to like build tools for managing that type of relationship because like, yeah, if you have longstanding business relationships, you can do whatever you want. And what, what we need is the easy onboarding for like, you know, anybody that doesn't want to touch the configuration whatsoever. Is yeah. the difficulty that you're trying to accomplish two things in the same code base and the same one connector? I mean, I know you probably not a desire to have two different versions of, you know, one for high end private, you know, uh, connections or maybe not private, but just a, a lot of traffic going back and forth in value versus the dynamic that you're talking about. I think that's a very, it's definitely a possibility. I think that part of what we want to achieve is if we can define this interface so that it makes sense. And I mean, to Stefan's point, if part of this interface is go to a database, then it's a database dependency. So if we can define this, then we can write really good, sophisticated settlement engines that are reusable, irrespective of what you're trying to get. And that's, that's, um, that's a really valuable. I'll, for what it's worth, I, I think the idea of the standardizing these sort of numbers, like have, and having the connector community, having the connector store its balance, and have a concept of what the maximum is, maybe minimum, um, and then like the settle threshold, settle to. I'm not sure whether the connector would know that, or it seems like the settlement engine you might know that. that here, at least. I, I, so I think so. My proposal would be the settlement engine is the right thing to calculate those and to have those configured. But the connector can get them on the settlement. The connector is the right thing to notify, to monitor when those triggers are hit. Mm -hmm. So the connector can say to the settlement engine, give me a safe maximum, give me a settlement threshold, and I will tell you as soon as I hit any of those things. That seems better. And then putting up the They do change kind of depending on the payment channel implementation, like your Settle threshold. If you're trying to, you're trying to not hit the, the min or max after you've passed the settle threshold, then if you're opening a, like a new payment channel in that time versus just sending a, a payment channel claim, it's a very different time window. Mm -hmm. so the and so, like the settlement engine will want to monitor the deposit threshold, right? Like independent um, of the settle threshold, and then the the settle threshold. Although I don't think it changes per connection, right? It's per ledger. But it could. It could. That's, that's foreseeable mm. that, you know, uh, I've got a payment channel and the payment channel closes and then when I reopen it, I open it with a smaller amount of liquidity. So I tell the connector and from now on for this account, the settlement threshold has changed. Whatever. 
it's, it's it's foreseeable, I guess. Yeah. I guess the point being that the connector is the right place to decide if those thresholds have been hit, but the settlement engine, I think, has a more complete information to decide what those numbers should be. And so the interface is basically an exchange of those things, as well as events like money's come in for a settlement of money. You need to send money. And in this model, who's the connector is the only one writing to the database still? So you're imagining the settlement engine does a settlement and then it's like, I settled for X units, go update the database. When I drew it, I, I was imagining the settlement engine would have its own database if it needs it for things like payment channels. And for simpler settlement engines, it might be stateless. Yeah. But, but the, the account balance would appear as in live. And then the settlement engine asks the connector sometimes to change it, but never changes it itself. Yeah, but I just want to raise that maybe in, in terms of like computer science, how they would solve that problem is, for example, the connector would subscribe to a topic, like use a queue to say, well, if this is updated, then tell me when it's updated. So it means that kind of solution for the actual process. process so we, we actually we use Redis streams. Um, Sorry, could you I, speak we don't do it exactly it? like this, but we did use streams in the first sort of iteration of what we did. So the only trick with that is that it's not atomic. So like, yeah. if I trust the clients, it could be in the schedule. I guess like the thing about the settlement threshold is you you when you hit the settlement threshold, you're not going to stop processing packets, but you're telling the settlement engine, go and do a settlement <coughs> because I'm going to hit my my max. So it doesn't have to be synchronous. So it can be just you know, drop it on a event stream. But there's then all that stuff around it. And like if that queue is you know really long, your notification that the settlement done gets lost behind a bunch of others. So that's that's not a good implementation. Um, I don't think you can scale with that the initial years. You get back. <laughs> <laughs> it's just on a whiteboard right now. question in this model is, does, do settlement engines speak to each other, or do they speak by ILP packets? Yeah, how does the settlement engine uh, talk to the connector, you're asking? Oh, no, how do settlement engines talk to each other? So remember, this is, this is representing a connector here. Yeah, we also have a settlement engine, and they're, you know, whatever. I think in this model, they never talk to each other. Yeah. They, I think yeah. you have to send it to the connector who sends it to the peer. That is what uh, Evan has in mind? Yeah. I, I mean, the, I guess the settlement engine could get its own ILP address. Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, like, having worked with the connectors, like, something that would be quite nice is basically you just accept an unsolicited connection, whether that be over WebSock, HP, whatever. You just reject packets if they're coming in. Like, you could have, like, some DDoS issues, but. Basically, then you do like a peer.settle.config, you configure how settlement takes place, you agree with how that takes place, and then you can start, if it needs pre-funding, that could be negotiated through the config, and then you can start doing transfer packets. And that's how the settlement takes place. Instead of having this whole like plug-in architecture where you've got to do the all first and then resolve the payment stuff, and it just seems a better way to handle it. Wait, sorry, what, so what was the conclusion of how the settlement engine just talked about? So if this settlement engine, for example, needs to send a payment channel to payment channel, yeah. how does it do that? Oh, so that's not what's wrong. Well, the proposal is <laughs> send it here and it's sent by an RP packet to get a settlement address. Yeah. So in this case, a bit, basically settlement engines are internal to the connector that they're on, and it is never the case that settlement engines directly exchange claims between untrusted peers. No, we make configuration a lot simpler, other than yeah. opening more ports. Yeah. 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 Which is that it's foreseeable, the value of this model is it's foreseeable that you know, two big entities who decide to run some proprietary settlement engine might decide like our settlement engines talk directly to one another. Whatever. I think the point like I think it's, it's probably better to not not we don't need to do that, that. But, but okay so then I would I would raise the question again like um, how do I make it so that like 
if my connector is not, it doesn't understand these messages that are addressed to peer.settle.xrp, it's trivial to have someone DOS my, uh, my settlement engine just by addressing things to that and sending me a ton of packets. So how do I prevent that? Say if you don't put any connection, right? If you can stop DOSing your peers yeah. on normal packets or settlement packets or executive. But I'm not, so I'm assuming that I have one settlement engine and it's written in JavaScript, and I'm assuming that I have auto scaling connectors written in Rust. No, no, no. <laughs> it's more it's more the auto scaling bit. Like I'm assuming that there's a single process that's watching the blockchain and doing settlement related stuff. And I'm assuming that that's not auto scale. If you have a feature to do with that. Yeah. Okay, that, like that, that's an answer. Like I, I'm, I'm kind of looking for like, if there's, if my connector is sending messages to my settlement engine, like what is the practical mechanism for making sure that those messages aren't taken yeah, down myself? Your architecture and our already support the fact that because it's an RP packet, it's going to be limiting stuff anyway. You can just say, for the ILP JavaScript connectors and an outgoing throughput middleware like a fairly tight yeah. I think it's a solvable problem. You could even have a, a throughput or a rate limiting middleware that rather than just being in memory uses a, yeah. uses the connectors database to make sure that between all the yeah. of the connector it never exceeds a rate. Yes. This could be quite interesting because now if you just do peer.settle for like say the content, you actually if we did peer.settle dot some unique identifier for the settlement engine, yeah. then the messages, then it would be quite trivial to like say whether that settlement engine is supported within your configuration because yeah. it's not so. Yeah. yeah. Um, one very small <laughs> thing that I was kind of annoyed by, maybe there's a very trivial answer to this, was um, <laughs> it's very it's very straightforward to think of how to set up the routing table such that the connector knows to forward messages that are addressed to that to the settlement engine. I couldn't think of a way that I like to figure out how to get the connector to route the outgoing messages properly because those are addressed to peer.settle.xrp or something, but they're from me. And so you need to send them away rather than sending them to me. <laughs> Good yeah. You mean you mean okay? Yeah. So you're injecting them in yeah, into the outside so line. Like, oh. Yeah, like because yeah. if they peer up, peer up, sell. No, they just, just bypass the router and that's just implementation. Just... Like connectors and things. Right? Okay. Yeah. Basically, we're saying we we want to define this interface. Um, we should probably figure out exactly what these functions are. Yeah. The goal is. Anything that this engine needs to send to that one, it sends by the connector as a pit up single packet. And that would include like notifications that the settlements come in. Uh, something we don't have today, which I mean we get to see as well, uh, interested is a request settlement. So like you should have settled me, like based on my view of the balance. And, and I know we've talked about My answer service. is that's a pretty trusted statement. It's, 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 it's a bizarre it's, thing to like yeah, to respond to. Against. Yeah. I think you can't automate handling that, but it's useful to know, maybe as in like an event. Yeah. That you go, well, my like, fear thinks I owe the money. Yeah, it's like what a triggered warning, like, basically, for the connector operations, yeah, which yeah. maybe can then be hooked into DevOps or whatever, but it's not like, it's, yeah. it's hard to write a that's rational the, response the, to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Goes, yeah. That's cool. When I get a request, that I just say, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a foot gun. <laughs> but to answer your question, there's no reason you could just not have just like an outgoing service that listens to the same settlement engine to have it on that outgoing platform. Like just, but I, I think the answer is just bypass the, the router and just, yeah. Got it. Cool. Next steps. Okay. Uh, so it's picking up maybe something you mentioned in your opening um, address, which was around actually the, the metrics around the load, the load testing of this. Is there a subgroup that's already informed that is looking at the actual load testing of this, of this on, the, you know, on the strain? Or is that no, that's good, but that is, good. so the question is about load testing and whether there's already a subgroup who's working on that. No, but we would love to have that. Would you like to volunteer? <laughs> <laughs>
I'm, I'm not, I'm, yeah. like, we can talk about that more, but like, honestly, I think uh, actually having people thinking about load testing different implementations and figuring out the performance of stuff and making sure we don't backslide is really, really important. So if anybody here is interested in getting involved in that, um, I think it would be really great to, to have some group kind of thinking about how we should do that. I yeah, think there's two sides, and what may be related in my two sides is a kind of case on a side of the other day that says if you have a command implementation, you can put it through a bunch of tests that we say this behaves as expected, and then some of those would also be in some of the testing. Uh, it's definitely something we plan to give up in terms, <laughs> but they have a bug they get. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, let's, let's, let's chat about that. Uh, I saw Graham back in work. David, do you volunteer or do you want no, to? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. I'll, I'll reach out. I'll put my hand yeah, back go, down. Go for it. Go for it. Uh, so, as somebody who doesn't want to write settlement engines, um, <laughs> I want to put a plug to have the interface, the implementation of the interface between connector and settlement engine be ILP. Uh, because uh, if I'm thinking I have a Java connector, um, WebSockets can be difficult or just non-preferable in Java. And so what I don't want to have to worry about is like, OK, how am I going to speak to a settlement engine? Am I going to speak REST? Am I going to speak WebSocket? Oh, that works sometimes, but not others. Am I going to roll like a, a protoba for some custom transport, right? What I liked about the Rafiki slide is it reduces transports to like four. You've got WebSocket, HTTP, two effectively, I forget the other uh, two, uh, UDP maybe, or... Essential. Yeah. Untested. But as a connector developer, I can focus on like maybe one or two of those, and then not really have to worry about mucking around with transport level stuff because I'm going to solve it as an ILP concern. You reuse everything you would write. I would push it even further and say, like, like why would we have different, in OK, straw man, like, why don't we just make it an HTTP API? Well, OK, so the, 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 the problem with that is uh, I think it depends on use case. If settlement happens pretty infrequently, then it's probably fine to maybe pull or whatever the back and forth is between these two. But if you need like some super high performance back and forth between connector and settlement engine, a REST API may or may not. Maybe it will, but it, like, how are you going to design it? Like, do you do an environment and not based on what you want? But is this stuff here that's basically events, streams, or is it when you need No, it's, I, I yeah. thought it was like notifying. When, so the messages that go from the connector to the settlement engine are like, I hit the cell threshold, I'm out. Like, I hit the max. Yeah. I'm not even sure there's any. Yeah. I would counter that. Here, here's a message from the peer. Yeah. So there's no messages. And then the settlement engine okay. to the connector is so, like, uh, yeah, got the, got a settlement. Change too big. I got an update of what the settlement threshold is. Something like that. Yeah. <coughs> I'd be wary of baking the settle threshold into the API itself. Like that the method of having that minimum and the settle threshold, like once you go past the threshold threshold, then you settle. That's like a pretty basic model for how to settle based off a given balance. So you're kind of constraining all future implementations to have that simple model. There's no way you can... Well, okay, so what, what's an example of a model that wouldn't fit that nicely? Or like, why, why would we change it from that? I mean, it depends. I mean, one more advanced thing, if you're always trying to keep, uh, make sure you never hit that min or max balance, you could base off the, like, the rate that packets are going through. They're like second and third derivatives you can do in terms of like what's the velocity that you're moving yeah. towards the threshold with yeah. and how fast the velocity changing if you want to go that far. Yeah, yeah um, and it depends on your... But I think those are like settlement engine API v2, v3 type things. Like I think... For changing the... Yeah, because yeah, I think there, there's a limited set of those. It's just more complexity um, that you may want as a further optimization. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you could just... If going back to the kind of straight reading the balance model, that leaves it entirely open for the connector to for the settlement engine to do whatever it wants. But it does require the settlement engine to be effectively like 
It's, it's a, it makes a high bandwidth communication. Yeah. Right, because it's like it, it needs to essentially be on, on top of all the balances somehow. Yeah. Like that push would be a change to it, and that goes away to create Just to clarify, uh, it sounds like there was some debate, or but it's, it sounds like the consensus in the room is that the amount of traffic between the connector and the settlement engine will be not so high. Is that the case with payment channel settlement? Or are there these extreme IOP cases? traffic is still much higher than some traffic, traffic, if you okay. want to like, think about like it. Like an order of magnitude or, or yeah. two? Yeah. Okay. One thing you could do is if you design the API properly, you could load balance it such that each settlement engine might be responsible only for one counterparty, yeah. for example. Yeah. That's neat. Or if it's a stateless uh, settlement engine, it could even be like yeah. scaled up. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, in the Rafiki presentation yesterday, um, the idea of business rules and being able to add on logic behind this, how that might impact or not impact what you're deciding, what these uh, requirements are at the connector, you know, what it's going to do, and is there going to be any latency or anything that might happen, or can improper rules impact whether or not you're going to cut off a client because of uh, what you have set up here at the you know minimum maximum yeah okay so i can answer that so, so with the rules i mean you can like that you can impact anything because if you hit a max packet threshold and one of those packets is maybe a settlement packet you might be dropping that mm -hmm. so that that is always the risk but if you the idea is if you're writing a custom rule you know what you do like you wouldn't just be writing a random custom rule that does stuff that you, you have, don't know the, the downstream effects of that. Yep. And it should be true that the interface is independent of any rules, right? That like the rules are going to inform when I talk to the interface, but they shouldn't affect like the, Correct. The, the necessity of what the interface does, except for perhaps a generic method for setting additional configs from the settlement engine. So that could possibly be like an extensible way to, um, we talked about sort of, you had derivatives of just the balance. You could set that up as just an additional rule on the connector and then an additional get and set config exactly. between you and the exactly. settlement engine to communicate that. Perhaps it might just be useful to clarify the problem and the solution that we're kind of getting to and the implication. Sorry, what is, what's one? Yeah, just as, a, as an open question, just some people like the, the problem here and the solution that we're kind of arriving to and so that's the implication. I guess my, my summary of it would be a um, couple of problems that we have today are that we don't have a good recommendation for if you want to integrate a new blockchain into Interledger, how to do that. Um, we also, uh, once we have a recommendation for that, we want a way to do it where the same code can be reused for different implementations of Interledger. Um, and then we're trying to figure out if this particular model that's been proposed would address the various use cases for different types of settlement relationships that we have. And if so, then it becomes a bit of just an API design question for how to communicate the specific types of messages that Adrian has written on the board between these two components. Yeah, at a high, even higher level to me, it's like, Blockchains are going to be independent from connector implementations, and blockchains will often have very strict sort of limitations around like, there's no API for this. There's no way to do that. And so right now, when everything was in JavaScript, there was kind of a pretty close relationship between the connector and the settlement engine. And there was a lot of sort of like detangling of that logic in the last months. And now we're trying to get to like, OK, let's imagine this particular thing that is independent from this connector and an interface between them so that in the future, when you're implementing a settlement engine, you're implementing that thing, which can be for a specific blockchain, which could use payment channels or could use on ledger settlement. And it talks to a connector doing this exact thing. And so now I can point you at least to an interface and then say, you have to choose the settlement engine based on APIs available, functionality of your blockchain available. But this is the sort of interface. 
It's, it's been it's been a rough rough year. I mean, to add to that, it's also like language specific. I mean, uh, David and uh, Evan have like fought lots with trying to implement a new connector in a new language. Where currently most of the, the, the plugins or so, like, so let's say we want to pair over XRP, so you use Patreon, okay? That's got a very specific like way it's done that was easy to do in JavaScript, but now translating that to Java and Rust was almost like impossible. Um, and we've also had settlement tied to actual communication protocol, um, which has been quite tough. So that, it's almost like an uncoupling of that, and then while uncoupling it, how do we do it better? And this seems better. So really high level thing, like we, we need to get to the point where we're just rolling out new new integrations with different blockchains. Like we've been talking about the theoretical ability for Interledger to integrate with tons of different stuff. And we've designed it so that it's super, like the actual Interledger protocol is super abstract from this, but not having this kind of very specific way of integrating more blockchains makes it super difficult to actually go from like the three we kind of support now to like a hundred or Pick any number, but like 50 currencies. I mean, the idea is like behind this API, you could have settlement over white forms. You could have settlement over whatever you want. That's, that's not um, And the intelligence of the settlement engineer is look at white forms with takes two days based on like this account when the connector says what settlement threshold should I use to go. I think that one challenge I'm thinking about with the, the settlement engine dictating these sort of numbers is like sort of based on what? Like the min I don't know, the minimum balance? That's that's like how much do, the minimum balance is how much do you trust your peer? That's something you have to tell it. It can't tell you. Sure. A lot of this will just be configured on the settlement. But at least the settlement engine can either just pass that over to the connector or say, well, this is a specific type of settlement system, and so I can calculate it based on something else. The point is that's not stuff that connector should think about. Connector is just routing packets and applying like rules to those. It, it shouldn't have to do that. That stuff is very specific to a settlement system as opposed to I'm just saying it's, it's a settlement system, but also like the specific relationship that you have. And as somebody mentioned yeah, before, yeah, like yeah, yeah. some of these things may vary more based on the account rather than even the settlement engine. So, I mean, we can go back and forth about like semantics. We're not being wise to just say, okay, well, let's try do one implementation, see what it looks like, everybody can get comments, and then move on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're not going to know this again. So it seems like we've we've reached some kind of temporary conclusion until such point when we go and, and implement it and realize it's all wrong and <laughs> we need to bring everyone back to San Francisco to have this discussion part two. So, so I mean, just building on what you said, part of like what I would argue is potentially a really nice connector implementation is that you they can figure anything on that connector itself, and that the connector could even you know. And, and we can figure that out. But things like accounts and stuff, those are very strongly related to settlement as well. And so, you know, I could maybe say I've got an account check for Evan and I see it in a certain way. That's all I need to say because everything else really should come from my business logic of the way that settlement The thresholds, the groupers, all of that potential. It's a bit of a thing, but there's, there's a lot that we can figure out and connect to that I think very settlement. To me, it feels yeah. not that different to like make an API call to the connector to be like, this is this account settlement threshold, or have the connector make an API call to the settlement engine to get that information. Like, one way or another, that is going to be configured. But, but if that number is not just static, if there's a chance that it could be influenced by stuff like how yeah. long does it take to settle, yeah. right based on that. To be fair, you can't determine how you can't determine a settlement threshold based off of just how long it takes to settle. You need to also know what the throughput is. Yeah, we think about it as max packet is important as well there. So like the and that's like literally your throughput per packet is max packet. Um, and sort of. I mean, I suppose 
Yeah, if you knew the max packet amount and the rate limit of packets, you could kind of determine a, a maximum on the throughput. But that's like if you were doing the most conservative, like let's settle as often as possible to make sure we suddenly get maxed out and we won't um, have a single second of, of running out of liquidity. Which maybe, maybe that's the right way to do it. Or at least it's like a very, it's a nice conservative bound yeah, to be like, I know I'm there and I can ratchet it up from there. But then that kind of is added as, um, that would be another field that you sort of request. Yeah, you would like want to know max max packet as well as max balance. All right. I, I recommend we have. Yeah. It seems like we've, we've gotten to a pretty good spot with this. So great discussion. I think this has been very, very productive. working discussion uh, and now there's lunch.